last talk of, uh, of this session. <coughs> Our speaker is Rishikesh uh, Narayanan. He is an associate professor at the Molecular Biophysics Unit, Indian Institute of Science. And he held a couple of uh, postdoc positions, one for a very long time at the University of Texas at Austin, and the other one at TIFR National Center for Biological Sciences. <coughs> he also happens to be our uh, senior when we were students here. And he was the brainy guy around working on neural networks. And then for a career in research, he went deep into single neurons. And he's going to talk about holistic, neuro holistic learning in biological neurons. Holistic neurons in biological learning. Thanks, Chandra. <laughs> As um, uh, Upi said that uh, to recurse uh, is to divine, I'm going to thank the organizing committee for uh, having me uh, <laughs> deliver this uh, lecture over here. Uh, if you don't understand why is that is recursion, I'm not going to explain it. Uh, so, um, and today's lecture, I'm going to deal with some of the basic assumptions uh, that go into um, the idea of uh, neural networks. Uh, and first, let me put the acknowledgement slides, uh, which, if this works. Um, so, all the members of the Cellular Neurophysiology Laboratory and the funding agencies, that's the reason why the lab is running, basically. So the whole is some, if, if you look at the dictionary, then it would say that it's the theory that parts of a whole are in intimate interconnection such that they cannot exist independently of the whole or cannot be understood or explained without reference to the whole. Right? So keep this definition in mind uh, and as we progress, uh, hopefully the, the definition will become much more clear and I will touch upon it at the end of it when we come to the summary slide basically. Right? Uh, so let's go back to the very beginning. Uh, this is uh, Ramoni Cajal, uh, pretty much considered the father of uh, modern neuroscience. Uh, and he was the one who proposed the so-called law of dynamic polarization, which looks kind of simplistic uh, from today's uh, world. But uh, at that point of time, in the 1800s, uh, uh, this was uh, uh, the way that was the, the, the law that defined uh, how neuron processes uh, information, basically, right? So, so you have this cell body. Um, this is a neuron. This is a typical neuron, a cartoon of a neuron, if you will. Uh, so there is a cell body over here, and you have dendrites, uh, which are um, the receiving part. So these uh, dendrites collect information from other neurons, basically. So there are synapses impinging on this structure, and you will have uh, information collected from different points. Uh, which converge onto the cell body, and there is an action potential that is generated over here at the axon initial segment, uh, which eventually propagates to other neurons, which will make, uh, this is the axon, and it would make contacts to other neuronal dendrites, uh, and that's how information processing occurs uh, in a single neuron, basically. Right? So that was uh, considered as the mechanism how a single neuron processes information and how the network uh, uh, behaves, basically. As time progressed, uh, we became more, uh, 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 knowledgeable about how a neuron functions. Uh, and we said that uh, the neuronal structure, if you look at the, the membrane over here, uh, that looks like this. So you have a lipid bilayer, and you have these leak channels that they're called us. Uh, so they are conducting ions across this uh, particular structure over here. Uh, and if you take this, uh, this lipid bilayer um, and take this uh, set of ion channels that are present over here, you could approximate them electrically as this RC circuit, basically. Right? So, so you have the R coming from this uh, leak channels. Uh, if the R is higher, it means that you have lesser number of leak channels and vice versa, I mean, um, the other side, other way around. Uh, and this V rest over here represents the resting membrane potential, which is the potential difference between the extracellular side of the neuron and the intracellular side of the neuron. Now, the capacitance over here, as electrical engineers, uh, I mean, as some, some of you could be electrical engineers, and you would understand that uh, this lipid bilayer structure is a dielectric, uh, a non-conducting medium of electricity. And you have on both sides, uh, you have ionic medium. You have ionic concentrations, uh, ionic solutions over here on this side, and you have ionic solution on this side, basically. And you will have two parallel plates which correspond to these ionic media uh, on either side. And there is this non-conducting uh, structure that is present in between, which uh, makes up the capacitance, basically. As a consequence of this RC circuit, uh, you have a low-pass filter that is imposed on uh, any signal that is basically transmitted from a dendritic location to the cell body. As we saw earlier, the dendrites receive information and that is transmitted to the cell body, which is where um, um, the integration occurs, as it were. So you have this uh, low-pass structure. So what it does is uh, you have a large dendritic signal, uh, which is uh, originating at this point over here. And as it translates, as it traverses through this dendritic structure, uh, 
it becomes much more smaller because of this leak channel. So these ions are going to escape away as they are traversing from here to the cell body. So you see that the amplitude is pretty high here, and it becomes much more lower at this point over here. And you also see that the sharp signal that you observe over here is uh, becoming much more smoother as a consequence of this low-pass filtering that is imposed on any signal that is traversing into this uh, structure. So, and if you look at uh, this, this, uh, this, if you look at the, the time domain representation of this, this is the Lorentzian. Uh, so, uh, consequently, the time domain part of this would be a uh, exponential charging curve. Uh, so, you would see that the, the time constant tau of that exponential would be on the order of 30, 40 milliseconds uh, for a cortical or a hippocampal neuron. So, the idea was that uh, a cortical or a hippocampal neuron is going to integrate information over this period of time. Uh, all the information that is impinging on the structure. And that integrated version, both spatially as well as temporally, is going to be conveyed to the cell body, which is going to generate an action potential if uh, that integrated signal crosses a certain threshold. Right? So, so that's the basic idea. So based on this basic structure, a simple model for single neuron function was that uh, you have these dendrites, uh, which are passive in nature, which is to say that they have only these leak channels. Uh, and you have these synapses, which are represented in blue. And you have uh, information coming from different other neurons impinging on those structures. Uh, there's a passive summation of this input. Uh, so you can also accommodate this attenuation. Let's say there is a signal that is originating over here versus here. And this attenuation is going to be lesser than this, because this distance uh, is lesser than this distance. Uh, and therefore, <coughs> the amount of attenuation that a signal incurs over here from here to here is going to be lesser. That can also be uh, accommodated into a weight factor over here, uh, so which also, which not only uh, accounts for the synaptic weight uh, in terms of what that synaptic structure is uh, doing over there, but also for this, uh, this attenuation that is uh, present uh, in this dendritic structure. Right? So, <clears throat> and you have a nonlinearity that is present uh, at the cell body. And if this summation, if this summation of the different inputs that are coming from different neurons, which is over here, and the weights associated with them. So if that linear summation crosses a certain threshold, which is given by the sigmoid over here, uh, which is the f over here, then this uh, neuron generates an action potential, which is propagated uh, to the next level. Right? So, so based on this simple idea that you have uh, a passive dendritic structure, and there are synapses impinging on it, uh, and there is an integrate and fire kind of a mechanism, you formulated uh, this kind of a model for neuronal function. In this simple model, if you want to learn in this simple model for, for a neuronal structure, it's kind of obvious uh, that the major point where you can make changes uh, are the synaptic weights. Right? So, so these were considered to be binary. Right? So you can have either firing or non-firing neurons. Uh, and you have the sigmoidal structure, which is a nonlinearity that is fixed. And therefore, if you want to change uh, something in this neuronal model for you to be able to learn, then the place to look for is this synapse over here. Right? So, so based on that, it was postulated uh, that uh, the, the cellular basis for learning and memory was uh, rooted in synaptic changes. Uh, and that is where these changes occur. That's what leads to uh, learning in these kinds of systems, basically. Right? So, so then uh, uh, you have this uh, synaptic learning theory, which was formulated. Uh, and neurons are simple uh, algebraic. Uh, summation units, and synapses change in response to learning. And they form a purative cellular substrate uh, for learning and memory. That was the, the postulate from the times of, uh, um, um, of uh, Ramon y Cajal. He also postulated things about how spines, where these uh, synaptic structures uh, impose, uh, could be mechanisms by which learning could be achieved, and things like that, basically. Right? So, so there is a, large, a long history associated with uh, this. Uh, Based on this and based on postulates by Hebb and others uh, which came over the year, actually this should be called as the James rule instead of being called as the Hebb rule because uh, William James came up with the same kind of statement uh, much before Hebb, but somehow it is, uh, it is uh, uh, given the Hebb rule formulation basically. Right? So, so based on this, there were several for, uh, synaptic uh, learning rules which were formulated and have uh, helped us. Uh, in understanding brain in terms of applications in real world applications, uh, in terms of uh, utility in real world applications, uh, and in terms of uh, uh, explaining certain structures uh, that are formed uh, 
in the, um, in the cortex during development and things like that. Uh, so there have been several synaptic learning rules which have been formulated uh, for different purposes. Uh, the questions were different uh, and the, the rules were different uh, and they were motivated by different kind of biological uh, phenomena and you had several kinds of rules which were formulated over the years. Uh, and there were connectivity patterns. Uh, you had either feed forward structures. Uh, with this simple neuron forming the, the computational unit over here, you had structures which had either feed forward connectivity or with recurrent connectivity. You had different kinds of rules which were created, uh, different kinds of quote unquote learning mechanisms which were formulated uh, to achieve a certain kind of uh, functionality at the end of the day basically. Right? So, so this was the basic formulation at that point of time based on the simple assumption that you have these, uh, these uh, uh, neurons uh, acting as uh, integrate and fire structures basically. There are so many networks that were formulated. In this narrative, um, this basic narrative that we have followed so far, it turned out later that we were driven by several oversimplifications uh, which uh, kind of hamper our understanding of the brain from the perspective of uh, um, learning theory from the, the, the theoretical end of it basically. So the first oversimplification is that uh, the nonlinearity that we saw over here resides only in the cell body and the rest of the neuron is just computing an algebraic sum of the inputs uh, and propagates it through the cell body. Right? So, so that was the first uh, oversimplification. So what is this nonlinearity? So this nonlinearity is what generates this action potential. Right? So this is an, uh, I mean, this is a real hippocampal neuron. Uh, I'm injecting a current of 250 picoampere into it. Uh, and you see that it charges up uh, and as it reaches a certain threshold voltage, uh, in this case it's around minus uh, 50 millivolts. Uh, you see that there is an action potential that is fired uh, and it comes back uh, within a millisecond uh, and eventually it will go back if I had turned on the, turned off the current over here. And so, so this uh, um, action potential, um, the, so the, the threshold over here, so you have the sigmoid where you say that uh, beyond a certain threshold value, I will fire an action potential. So that threshold voltage comes from this particular uh, mechanism where you are integrating input, in this case it's a straight line and therefore you have an exponential charging curve here. And you see that there is an action potential fire. This is what uh, is the, um, the nonlinearity that is present here. What mediates this? Uh, this uh, nonlinearity is mediated by what are known as ion channels. Uh, so these ion channels uh, sit on the membrane over here. Uh, this is the lipid bilayer that I was talking about. Uh, this is the external media. This is the inside of a neuron. Uh, and these are passive, uh, I mean, these are uh, structures which are which are dependent on voltage, dependent on, uh, um, on certain uh, ligands binding onto them and things like that. Uh, so once these open, so they are typically in a closed state uh, and once they open, let's say if this were sodium ion, you would have uh, a passive diffusion of these, uh, I mean let's quote unquote passive diffusion into this, uh, uh, in, into the neuron and you will have a change in the membrane potential and these ion channels uh, are the ones that are mediating this action potential over here. Briefly, you would have this rising phase of it mediated by uh, sodium channel activation and the falling phase of it mediated by uh, uh, sodium channel inactivation as well as uh, uh, potassium channel uh, activation basically. Right? So, so that is the nonlinearity that is present on the membrane and that is what is mediating um, the, the generation of an action potential in these kinds of neuronal structures. So, however, once we came to a point where we were able to record from dendrites until a certain point, uh, until the 80s and 90s, uh, we were unable to record from dendrites because uh, these structures are 2 micron in, uh, in uh, uh, diameter. This on the other hand is around 10 micron, 20 micron basically. And therefore recording from these neuronal structures, uh, these somatic structures uh, was much more easier than recording from these dendritic structures. Uh, we did not have the technique. Uh, to record from this dendritic structures uh, and therefore we did not record, therefore we assumed, uh, assumption is the mother of all screw ups, uh, so we assumed that these dendritic structures uh, don't have any ion channel basically. Right? So once we started recording from these uh, dendritic structures, uh, it became very, very clear that uh, these dendritic structures also express these ion channels. Uh, for instance, the sodium channel that I was talking about. Uh, which actually leads to the, the generation of action potential. That is expressed almost at equal density throughout the entire dendritic structure over here in hippocampal pyramidal neurons. Right? So, so you have sodium channels present throughout, uh, which means that uh, you don't just generate action potentials over here. 
You can also have spikes initiated uh, at these locations in the dendrite. Uh, so this becomes a non-passive active structure over here. Right? So, and there are also certain channels uh, <coughs> like this channel, uh, the Hetzian channel, which is uh, the pacemaker channel, uh, uh, which is uh, the reason why your heart is beating and which is the reason why there are several kinds of oscillations in your brain. So these channels uh, and these uh, other type of channels, which is the KV4.2 potassium channel, they are actually present at higher density in the distal end of the dendrite uh, than at the soma. So there is not just a nonlinearity that is expressed in the dendrite, uh, but they are also expressed at higher densities in certain cases uh, in these uh, uh, distal parts of the dendrite. Uh, and therefore, it became very, very clear that the soma is not the only point uh, which is endowed with a nonlinearity, you also have nonlinearities expressed at other parts of the dendrite, basically. And it, it, it also clear, became clear that different neurons, it's not like all neurons are made exactly the same. Uh, if you look at mitral cells, neocortical cells, CA1 cells, uh, um, you look, the, you see that the different channels, this is the sodium channel, this is the one type of potassium channel, this is the Hessian channel, the pacemaker channel that I was talking about. Uh, you look at the densities of how they are across the dendritic structure, you see that the pattern of expression is very unique. Uh, as I mentioned, in a hippocampal pyramidal neuron, you see that the density is almost uniform throughout the entire dendritic structure. On the other hand, if you look at the Purkinje cell over here, there you see that uh, the soma has uh, a high density of sodium channels, uh, but even the most proximal dendrite uh, has very little sodium channel expressed over there. There is no sodium channel in the dendrite over here. So each and every neuron is unique. Uh, and the type of channels that it expresses, uh, the kind of uh, um, 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 gradient that it has for the different uh, uh, channels that are expressed there are very unique to the kind of processing that it does in that particular location. Right? So, so neurons don't really obey the law of dynamic polarization. We humans like to impose certain laws on neurons. Uh, but they don't really obey that basically. Right? So, so it was discovered over this, uh, over the past 20, 25 years uh, that action potentials, uh, it was initially thought that they just initiate over here and propagate into the axon to the next level. Now, that's the basis of the uni unidirectional flow of information in, uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, the law of dynamic polarization. But it became very clear that the, because of the expression of sodium channels over here, you also saw that uh, the, the action potential back propagated. It has nothing to do with the, the back propagation algorithm that is used in uh, uh, the neural network literature. Uh, it back propagates uh, into the dendritic structure over here. Um, and therefore, information flow is bidirectional. It is not unidirectional. Uh, spikes can initiate at dendritic sites. Uh, this is not the only place where you can initiate spikes. Uh, you can have spikes initiated at this location as well. Uh, and because of the expression of these Hetzian channels that I was talking about, uh, you will also see that uh, um, neurons will cease to become simple integrate and fire low pass unit. Uh, instead, you will have a band pass structure. And that band pass structure is very location dependent. Uh, as I mentioned, the Hetzian channels express at higher densities uh, at the distal dendritic locations. Uh, and therefore, you will see that there is a distinction in terms of the quote unquote uh, resonance frequency as I will come in a minute uh, uh, in this place versus uh, here basically. Let's go through this one by one. Uh, this was the first uh, unequivocal demonstration that uh, action potentials do back propagate. Uh, you have two electrodes on the same neuron, the blue electrode uh, and the green electrode. It's just two different fluorescent dyes. Uh, and you see that uh, um, this continuous structure, if you initiate an action potential at the cell body, that propagates uh, to the dendritic location as well. Right? So because uh, earlier it was thought that uh, it doesn't propagate because the frequency of this signal is pretty high. Uh, this width is on the order of one millisecond. And because of the capacitive structure over here, uh, the propagation ceases to um, be sustained along this dendrite. Uh, but it became very clear that it is indeed sustained. Uh, irrespective of what mechanism you use for uh, uh, initiating the action potential, you see that the, the action potential actually back propagates, uh, making information flow to be bidirectional, not unidirectional as it was postulated earlier, basically. Then we also have this uh, dendritic structure expressing, uh, uh, expressing sodium channels. Uh, so if you activate uh, individual synapses, so here you're looking at uh, this part of the branch, uh, and you have different synapses located over here. Uh, and you ha now have the capability to activate them individually, each of them individually. Now if you ask a question of if I activate all of them together, will the summation be linear 
or is it going to be nonlinear? In that particular oblique structure, you're not even initiating an action potential over here. It turns out uh, that until a certain number of uh, synaptic inputs coming over here, the summation is kind of linear. Beyond that, uh, you see that the, the summation at this branch over here itself uh, becomes nonlinear. And you have a huge difference in the DVDT, which is the, um, the, the voltage recorded. Uh, take the voltage and uh, differentiate it with reference to time, which is a better measure of uh, the presence of a dendritic spike. Uh, and you see that there is a dendritic spike initiated over here, and that propagates into the cell body. Right? So, so it's not just uh, the, the cell body that is capable of initiating spikes. Uh, each and every branch is endowed with a mechanism to produce these dendritic spikes. Uh, so the idea that the nonlinearities are not present uh, in the dendrites uh, is totally out of the window. Right? Uh, and you also see that it's, it's not like uh, the density is uniform. Uh, there are certain branches of the same neuron which are capable of producing this huge dendritic spike, basically. On the other hand, certain other branches of the same neuron are weaker, and they don't uh, uh, express the ability to generate these uh, dendritic spikes. Uh, and it turned out that these differences are because of uh, the expression profile of one single channel, uh, which is the A-type potassium channel, basically. And that controls the ability or the amount of nonlinearity that is expressed in each of these branches. Uh, so a single neuron has different branches, and each branch has uh, a different nonlinearity associated with it uh, in terms of its ability to summate uh, the inputs that are coming onto it, uh, and either generate a dendritic spike uh, or not generate a dendritic spike. Excuse me. The third thing uh, is about this HCN channels. Uh, so, so as I mentioned, uh, these channels are expressed at higher densities over here. And because we were able to record from these dendrites, uh, what we did was uh, we recorded at different locations along this neuron over here. Uh, and when we uh, looked at the resonance frequency, so you inject a chirp stimulus, uh, and you would uh, measure the resonance frequency of uh, the neuron at different locations. Uh, Normally, if you don't have uh, this particular channel expressed, uh, you would typically get the low-pass filter that I was talking about. Uh, if the HCN channels are expressed over there, you would see that that would become a band-pass filter. And that resonance frequency over here is a function of the HCN channel conductance. Uh, it's a kind of square root over here. Uh, and you would see that uh, uh, because the channel is expressed at higher densities at this end of it, uh, the resonance frequency is much higher at the distal end of it. Uh, compared to um, the proximal end of it. Uh, and this gives you uh, uh, a, a neuron which is capable of processing inputs uh, in a location dependent manner, where an input that is coming over here is going to face a filter which is centered at around 11 hertz. Uh, on the other hand, that is coming, something that is coming over here is going to face a filter that's at 5 hertz, basically. Right? So, so you have a location dependent uh, uh, filtering process that's going on, and that is because of this channel. This is a blocker of this channel. So we showed it with both uh, uh, simulations as well as experiment uh, that this is uh, uh, achieved as a consequence of the presence of HCN channels. So if you add on to top of this, uh, the several phenomena that are expressed in single neurons, uh, I don't have the time to go through this, uh, but this is graded persistent activity. These are subcellular, I mean, subthreshold oscillations. Uh, and OP briefly mentioned about this uh, uh, direction selectivity in single neurons uh, and things like that. Uh, if you put all of this together, then you come up with a monstrosity, as it were, uh, on, uh, as to what exactly a single mammalian neuron can do electrically. On top of it, if you put all the signaling mechanisms, uh, that are part of this. Uh, so the signaling mechanisms are important. Uh, I mean, you can just ignore this and say that uh, I don't care about the biology of it. Uh, but if you don't care about the biology of it, uh, nothing will change. Right? So if you want anything to change in this electrical system, the electrical system is mediated by these ion channels. Uh, and these ion channels, if you want it or not, uh, are biological uh, molecules. Uh, and they are controlled by the signaling mechanism. And the rules for plasticity for each of these uh, these molecules uh, is driven by the expression profile of these biological molecules over here. Uh, so if you want to really understand how learning occurs, uh, you want to understand this biological uh, signaling mechanism. Because without this, without this responding to the electrical inputs, and without this changing the, the composition of the membrane, you're not getting any learning, any plasticity, basically. Right? So, so you want to understand the learning structure that is present over here. You want to understand the biology. There is no escape from that, basically. So if you put all of this together, then you get a single neuron. 
Right? So, so now you think about um, the approximation that we had uh, in the 80s. Uh, and we are still stuck with this in some senses. Uh, we are still developing learning theory with the assumption that the neuron is functioning like this. Uh, but in reality, it's much more than this over here. Right? So, so that's the first oversimplification. So we assumed that uh, a neuron that is capable of so much is uh, just this simple device, uh, which is because of a historic anomaly uh, of law of dynamic polarization of the inability to record from dendrites and so on and so forth. Uh, because of that, uh, we are stuck with this uh, even today, whereas in reality, this is what the case is. The second oversimplification is the assumption that uh, when you have uh, repeated uh, pairings, as postulated by Hebb, you are changing only the synapses, uh, and nothing else in the entire neuron or beyond is changing as a consequence of this pairing. Right? So that's the second oversimplification that we did. Uh, so this is what is called as a theta burst pairing protocol. Uh, <clears throat> so here, what you're doing is uh, you're, you're pairing the presynaptic action potential, I mean the, the firing of the presynaptic neuron and the firing of the postsynaptic neuron. Now, you're repeatedly pairing them, basically, the way uh, Hebb had postulated. Uh, and as a consequence of that, you will have an increase in the synaptic strength. Uh, if you have repeated pairings, then you will have uh, quote unquote LTP or long term potentiation of this synapse that is present over here. Uh, this is a protocol that we have used for years to induce synaptic plasticity, to study synaptic plasticity under in vitro conditions. And even under in vivo conditions, we have seen that uh, this kind of uh, uh, a protocol will elicit strong, robust uh, LTP in neurons, basically. Right, so, so now I'm going to focus only on this, uh, this uh, uh, pairing protocol. Uh, this is uh, as postulated by Hebb. And we assumed very happily over the years that uh, the only thing that it changes uh, is this synaptic strength over here. Uh, and I will try to um, show that that is not indeed the case, basically. And it's nothing new. Uh, if you go back to the first paper that came on um, long-term potentiation, the, the landmark paper, which uh, is by Bliss and Lomo, there in the abstract, it mentions uh, that there is an increase in the efficiency of synaptic transmission. And there is also an increase in the excitability of the granule cell population. Right? Uh, and they also mention that uh, it could be because of intrinsic factors, uh, such as those which determine threshold, uh, the, the ones that determine threshold. In, in most neurons uh, is uh, the sodium channel. One of the prominent things that controls threshold uh, is the sodium channel. So this idea that uh, changes are beyond synapses uh, is not something new. It has been there ever since the first experimental uh, uh, I mean kind of verification of uh, Hebb's postulate. Uh, but people chose to um, look at only this, uh, again, because of historic anomalies. Uh, I mean, starting from Hebb's postulate, starting from law of dynamic polarization, law of and, and, and uh, um, the ideas that uh, you can have learning um, uh, from only synaptic changes, uh, the Hopf field network, uh, the back propagating, uh, all of the back propagation algorithm, and so on and so forth. Um, all, because of all of this, uh, people chose to focus uh, on only the synapses uh, and ignore, as it were, the other things that are changing in, uh, in, 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 with the same kind of learning paradigms, uh, with the same kind of uh, uh, protocols that you use for inducing synaptic plasticity. So now, because of uh, the, the work over the past 15 years and because of the ability to record from dendrites, uh, it's very clear that it's not just uh, synapses that undergo changes. Uh, you also have changes in these ion channels, uh, the nonlinearities that I was talking about. Uh, you can have changes in them, either localized to one specific branch, as shown over here, or you could have this LTP or the, the, the change in synapses over here, all right. Uh, but along with that, for the same learning paradigm, for the same um, plasticity-inducing protocol, you will have changes throughout the entire neuron in certain other ion channels. Uh, as I promised, I will focus only on the theta burst pairing protocol which we have for years uh, assumed uh, to be inducing only uh, localized uh, synaptic plasticity. And I'll show you some examples uh, where that same protocol induces changes in certain channels, uh, which are local, and induces changes in certain other channels, uh, which are kind of global, basically. Right? Uh, so this is the, the first example. Uh, so here, I'm, I mean, I'm th th this is with the same theta burst pairing protocol. Uh, and you observe that there is change in uh, synaptic weight. There is an increase in synaptic weight. Uh, but you also observe that uh, the back propagating action potential that I was talking about, which propagates from the cell body to the dendrite, uh, 
the amplitude of that back propagating action potential also increases uh, as a consequence uh, of the same um, theta burst pairing protocol and that is something which is confined to that location it doesn't go beyond that particular location they recorded recorded at different locations uh, and found that it was very localized basically and you also see i mentioned about two sets of branches uh, one that is strong and another that is uh, weak uh, and here uh, they showed that you can take a branch which is weak uh, induce the ltp protocol the same theta burst pairing protocol i'm not talking about any other protocol you observe that uh, that branch becomes a strong branch basically right so so it's 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 important to emphasize here that just because you don't measure something does not mean that that is not changing right so so you you were just measuring synaptic weights uh, and you observed that that changed with learning paradigms and things like that uh, and you concluded that the synaptic plasticity was the reason why that particular learning was occurring without even bothering to record uh, changes in any other thing that is changing in the neuronal structure or the structures that are around that particular location basically right so when you start measuring you observe that uh, it's not just the synaptic weight that is changing you have ion channels changing and you will see that there are several things that change and even this case uh, so this is the resonance frequency that i was talking about uh, <coughs> and you can have uh, the same theta burst pairing protocol and you would see that uh, it's not just synaptic changes that occur you also see that uh, the resonance frequency has shifted uh, from around 5 hertz uh, to around 6.5 hertz in this case uh, after this ltp inducing protocol right so and this change is more global right so so the previous case we talked about back propagating action potentials uh, that is more localized here on the other hand uh, you can record from three different locations uh, you can measure this resonant the 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 epsp slope which is ltp and you also measure this uh, resonance frequency and you observe that it increases uh, throughout the entire dendritic structure not only close to that particular stimulus point over here right so with the same theta burst pairing protocol you have localized changes in certain ion channels uh, and you have global changes uh, in certain other ion channels i'll come back to you at the end of the lecture right so because i don't want to hamper the flow so you have uh, in the same uh, neuronal structure with the same theta burst pairing protocol you have changes uh, in some cases which are global and in some other cases uh, that are local basically right so so it is because of changes in ion channels uh, that are um, uh, observed over here and not only is uh, this kind of plasticity occurring that is also bidirectional if you induce ltp you saw that if you have an increase in the synaptic weight uh, you have a decrease in uh, input resistance uh, increase in resonance frequency on the other hand if you induce a ltd protocol and reduce the synaptic weight uh, you see that the resonance frequency decreases uh, and the input resistance increases right so opposite directions so everything is going in opposite directions uh, and you would also see that uh, if you block the ltp so if you thought that uh, by blocking ltp i can show that learning doesn't occur and therefore ltp is memory then you would be posed with a question that if i block this uh, form of plasticity in uh, in synaptic changes uh, you would also observe that the intrinsic changes are also gone the hcn plasticity is gone the a type potassium channel plasticity is gone so you are left with a scenario where you are unable to block one form of plasticity without altering the other and whenever there is plasticity occurring it is touching several things at the same time and you you, you if you measure only one of them and conclude that hcn channels are responsible for learning and memory you would not be you would be as wrong as concluding that synaptic plasticity is what is me <coughs> is mediating learning and memory basically right so so the summary of uh, the second oversimplification uh, is that synaptic plasticity protocols uh, result in concurrent plasticity in several ion channels and pumps and transporters and so many other things uh, mediated by the same downstream mechanism the signaling mechanisms uh, as that of synaptic plasticity right so so there are several uh, uh, review papers in the literature uh, and ion channel plasticity has been shown with several learning paradigms uh, as well right so, so i put up some references uh, for you to look at it uh, so if you're interested in adding evidence so it's 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 a it's a global obsession um for uh, learning and memory 
to be solely mediated by any one form of plasticity. The most famous one is the synaptic plasticity or intrinsic plasticity or structural plasticity in one set of synapses or neurons. Uh, be sure to ask yourself, uh, are you sure nothing else is changing in neurons uh, or cells? I put this because there are also glial cells uh, of the same brain regions uh, or the others which could be mediating, contributing to the observed behavioral changes. Uh, you can't just measure one thing and find a correlation and declare that uh, this change is what is mediating learning and memory. Nothing can be more absurd than that. Uh, so correlation does not imply causation and not measuring other forms of plasticity or plasticity in other brain regions uh, does not mean they don't exist basically. Right? Uh, so if plasticity is ubiquitous, if it is all pervading, if it is all pervasive, if it, if it is going to be present uh, in all possible things that are uh, measurable and if everything changes with learning, where does one even start? Uh, so do you just give up and say that, oh well, I mean, in the brain something changes and that's what mediates uh, learning and memory and go home. Uh, is that what you do? So, um, <clears throat> so in this paper, uh, um, Kim and Linden, uh, so they talk about, excuse me, um, they talk about ubiquitous plasticity and memory storage. Uh, there he puts up this quote uh, and says, uh, too much of a good thing can be wonderful. Right? Uh, so holism, I said that I'll kind of, kind of revisit it uh, in the middle of the talk. Uh, I said I, I'll revisit it at the end of the talk, but uh, holism implies that plasticity um, in different constitutive components uh, should be considered as a whole given the intimate interconnections between different forms of plasticity with reference to their locus as to where exactly they are changing uh, and underlying signaling mechanism. No point in compartmentalizing or considering only one form of plasticity to be uh, responsible for uh, the learning process. All right, so the word of the day is uh, degeneracy. This is not uh, from the physics standpoint, not from the, the, the mathematics standpoint, uh, but from a biological standpoint. Uh, um, I mean, I, I, this is kind of mandatory reading for my lab people and I suggest strongly, doesn't matter what your uh, uh, field is, if you're interested in uh, brain computation and learning or any form of biology for that matter, I strongly suggest that you go back and read this, uh, this review about uh, degeneracy and complexity in biological system. The bottom line is that evolution is not stupid. Um, so degeneracy is the ability of uh, elements uh, that are structurally different to perform the same function or yield the same output. Uh, right? So degeneracy is not redundancy. Redundancy is uh, the case where the same function is performed by identical elements. If one fails, uh, the other takes over basically. On the other hand, uh, degeneracy is the case uh, which involves structurally different elements, uh, um, may yield the same or different functions uh, depending on the context in which it is expressed. Uh, the best uh, um, analogy for this uh, was what Chris talked about. Uh, it occurred to me that that's a very good analogy for, uh, for uh, uh, degeneracy. Um, Chris talked about the internet. Uh, I don't know how many of you there were for, there for the, the first uh, uh, talk by Chris Gopalakrishnan. Uh, so he talked about the internet uh, and he said that uh, you type in a certain address uh, URL uh, in your web browser uh, and that request uh, is processed by several things in the middle. There is a black box in between basically. Right? So, and eventually you get the data from the server. It is impossible to predict the route uh, that is taken by the request uh, and it is also impossible to predict the, the, the route that is taken by the information that is in that web page uh, coming back to your server basically. Right? So, so there are several routes it could take uh, and you could have structurally very different components. It could, it could be traveling on an optical fiber cable, it could be traveling on the satellite, uh, it could be touching the satellite and coming back basically or it could be running on a Mac system, it could be running on a Linux system, it could be running on a Windows system. So you have structurally very distinct things that are happening. But at the end of the day, your function, your goal, your physiology uh, in this case uh, is to achieve that transmittance of information from one end to the other. How you achieve it uh, is through different routes. Uh, now if you were a biologist and if you assume that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the connectivity or the synapses in this case, uh, so you can extend the analogy and think about it for yourself uh, as to what it would mean uh, to take this. Uh, simple analogy to a similarity and bore yourself to death, I'm not going to do that. Uh, so you will see that, you will realize that different structural components uh, can mediate this process uh, 
and you will have uh, uh, the same outcome that you are visiting that particular website. Uh, how you achieved it, uh, what exactly was the path you took uh, is something you do not know anything about. Right? Uh, so it has been, so this is in that paper, uh, the same paper that I was mentioned and uh, the paper talks about uh, the expression of degeneracy across different scales of biological systems basically. Uh, you can look at it from the behavioral end, you can look at it from the gene end. Uh, so this is the genetic code and at this end it is inter-animal communication. Um, so you can go through this and the paper kind of predicted several things uh, that came up after that uh, in terms of our understanding of, uh, of biological systems basically. So what does this imply? Uh, why did I put up, uh, why did I put this up uh, in this kind of a scenario? So um, the postulate or the implication would be that uh, learning is achieved not through any single form of plasticity, but through distinct combination of plasticity expressed in set of, uh, in sets of different, different sets of different neurons basically. So the, the idea would be that uh, you don't have uh, a one to one mapping between a form of plasticity and learning uh, or uh, only a set of synapses uh, and learning or only a set of ion channels and learning. But each and every time, depending upon the state of the brain, state of the neuron, state of the system, you would recruit a different uh, set of things. So, so it's like engineering, I sit where. So you have uh, a computer vision, for instance, you have a bunch of tools, right? So you have a bunch of tools. Uh, and for a given image, for a given uh, uh, application, you will have to choose the right tool, basically. Right? So you can't say that uh, I will have this tool and I will use it for all possible applications that come to me that doesn't work basically. It has to depend on, it has to be dependent upon the state of the system, it has to be dependent upon the data and therefore the brain is equipped with different forms of, uh, um, of, uh, of learning or changes or plasticity and it recruits uh, uh, different sets of them in the process of accomplishing this learning process basically. That would be the conclusion. So um, it's, it's kind of obvious uh, that you would ask me show me the data. Um, so I have, I don't have obviously the, the direct line of uh, evidence uh, to uh, prove or disprove, uh, to add lines of evidence or disprove this kind of a postulate over here. Uh, but I will show you some indirect things. The first line, uh, first set of uh, evidence that I'm going to present uh, is uh, that experience dependent pathological changes uh, in the nervous system are ubiquitous. Uh, they are not synaptic only, they are not intrinsic only, they are not structural only. I listed all of this without animation because uh, I'm not going to read it. Uh, so there are different examples, uh, so learning task, enriched environment, monocular deprivation in visual cortex, uh, fragile X syndrome, uh, epilepsy. If you look at it, uh, you will see that there are structural changes, there are synaptic changes, there are intrinsic changes uh, in each of them. And we have, of course, we do not know what is the chicken and what the egg is. We don't have uh, any clue about that, uh, but uh, this is one line of evidence uh, that is uh, uh, supporting this postulate uh, that there is not one form of plasticity that is mediating learning, but there are several forms of it. The second line of evidence uh, is a kind of sufficiency. If you have to obtain a certain physiological outcome, it is uh, through different means, uh, it is important to show that sufficiency, that you have that physiological goal and you can indeed achieve that physiological goal through different structural combinations, right? So that sufficiency has to come into picture. Uh, this is not really necessity, but uh, this shows that in real <coughs> learning tasks and uh, uh, real world pathological syndromes, uh, you observe that there are changes that are spanning the entire brain structure, not limited to one particular structure or one particular ion channel basically, right? So, so um, the, the second part, as I said, uh, is that similar functionality could be achieved uh, from disparate structural combinations across scales. Uh, <coughs> and this started in 1993 uh, with the Hodgkin and Huxley system, uh, which was taken up by some Foster et al. And they put together mechanisms to show that you can achieve the same firing rates uh, with different combinations of ion channels, basically. So I'll start at the behavioral end. Uh, so this is uh, uh, a recent paper in science. Uh, and they uh, looked at different neurons, they activated them using channel adoption, optogenetically activated different neurons over here. Uh, and they were looking at the behavioral outcomes of what exactly this larva would do. So whether it would escape or turn or back up basically. <coughs> and what they found was, uh, it was not like there was a one to one mapping. So if you look at all the escapes, so these are the different neurons over here. Uh, there are several neurons which are responsible for, um, which led to the escape behavior. Uh, and you also see, 
a single neuron can mediate all three of them basically right so so you have a many to many mapping between neurons and behavior so you don't have a single neuron that is related to escape uh, a single neuron that is related to backup a single neuron that is related to turn you have a bunch of them that are responsible for this kind of a mechanism over here right so this is from a uh, news and views for this particular article uh, written by eve marder uh, so eve marder was the one who has uh, who started this whole idea of degeneracy in uh, in uh, a much more simpler system which is the 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 um, the uh, the stomatogastric uh, um, oscillations that are present over here right so these are three different neurons uh, and you have this specific uh, uh, pattern of oscillations uh, the burst uh, and the latent the differences between these uh, these uh, neuron fire say for instance the latency between this neuron firing and this one firing there is a specific timing associated with this uh, so what they did was uh, they performed a stochastic search uh, on different uh, uh, ion channels on different uh, um, synaptic uh, weights uh, in a network uh, performed some hundreds of thousands um, millions of uh, uh, neuronal um, simulations basically and uh, look picked up only those models uh, which had shown uh, um, the the behavior the network behavior to be exactly similar to the physiological system and when they did that uh, so here you see that you have two models which have exactly the same kind of behavior in terms of uh, what is required uh, and if you go back and look at the the individual parameters uh, the key, the calcium activated potassium channel the sodium channel and so on and so forth uh, and the synaptic conductances uh, you see that they are all over the place in this case uh, this was high this is low this is high here on the other hand this is low so it's it shows that you can have different structural combinations uh, eliciting the same functional response uh, that is the sufficiency proof for you at the network level so you have uh, the same outcome which can be achieved uh, through different combinations of synaptic as well as intrinsic properties uh, coming together to give you this uh, you don't have to maintain each and every conductance uh, each and every synaptic weight at specific levels for you to be able to achieve this right uh, so we showed the same thing uh, um, in a dendritic structural level uh, so i talked about this resonance frequency map over here uh, so there is that resonance frequency map uh, <coughs> the input resistance reduces the back propagating action potential reduces uh, so we took six different uh, structures uh, and rahul had uh, performed this set of simulations uh, with different parameters uh, and here you see that uh, the physiological outcomes are exactly matching with each other are close within the the uh, the expected ranges uh, but if you look at the individual parameters so there are five different colors uh, each of them represents different neurons uh, so the physiologically they are similar but if you look at the parameters these five different models uh, are all over the place basically right again showing that across the dendrite you don't need to maintain these ion channels at specific values uh, for you to be able to maintain the structurally constrained uh, functional maps as we called it uh, um, for you to be able to get this physiological um, equivalence uh, right so that is uh, so first we started with behavioral level this is the network level uh, and this is at a single neuron level and even from the perspective of plasticity so if you want to uh, achieve a specific level of uh, short term plasticity or long term plasticity so we showed that so these are synaptic filters uh, achieved as a consequence of uh, short term plasticity profile expressed in the presynaptic neuron and you see that they are almost identical to each other these five different uh, uh, synaptic plasticity profiles over here but the underlying parameters in the boton are all over the place so, right and these are long term plasticity profiles uh, these are the bcm learning rules uh, as they are called us uh, and you can see that these bcm learning rules uh, are kind of overlapping with each other but again the parameters that are involved uh, are all over the place over here right so again giving you the sufficiency proof uh, that uh, you don't require each and every component that is present over there to be maintained at a specific value for you to be able to achieve physiological equivalence uh, you can have structurally very different components uh, so different ion channels are encoded by different sets of amino acids uh, and they have different uh, conformational profiles uh, each of them uh, have their own uh, machinery for expression and things like that uh, so despite all that difference uh, if you have uh, a set of uh, things that are um, i mean uh, different combinations of these structurally different uh, uh, elements can come together to give you exactly the same physiological outcome 
So, there is its sufficiency proof basically. So, does this mean that I have uh, shown you that the postulate is indeed true? Of course, not right. So, so the postulate was that uh, learning is uh, mediated by changes in several different uh, uh, components uh, and there are several ways of achieving this learning process. Uh, do not expect a one to one relationship uh, in, uh, in learning structures. Uh, that was the postulate basically. So, I have shown you mechanisms where uh, shown you learning tasks where several things change. Uh, when people started measuring other things, uh, they observed that they also change. Uh, and I have also shown you the sufficiency proof uh, that uh, uh, the same functionality can be achieved uh, using different combinations of structural components that are present over here. But that does not necessarily mean that I have shown you that the postulate is indeed right. Uh, that is a long way to go basically. Right? Uh, so, to summarize, uh, 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 the old view was that Cahal's law of dynamic polarization uh, was the, I mean, uh, the guiding stone, uh, and the neuron, neuronal dendrites are passive. Uh, therefore, they perform uh, algebraic sum of inputs uh, with a single nonlinearity at the cell body, which is the spike initiation. Uh, and the new view is that uh, the presence and plasticity of nonlinear computation mechanisms and dendrites of a single neuron, together with other biochemical signaling mechanisms. Uh, make it a really powerful information processing machine to uh, take this neuronal structure and make it like this as a single, I mean an integrate and fire structure is, 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 is a really a shame basically. Right? So, it is important to harness this power of a single neuron. Without that you are not doing justice to what real biological neurons are. So, a real biological neuron is not neither a perceptron nor an integrate and fire system. It is important to account for the computational complexity of a single neuron. Uh, plasticity is ubiquitous. Uh, uh, it is not confined to synapses, uh, not confined to you can pick your favorite channel. My favorite channel let us say is Hetzian channels, which is true. And I do not stand up and say that uh, Hetzian channels mediate learning and memory, because I know that I cannot show that. Uh, because when something changes, uh, something else also changes. Uh, and therefore, it would be impossible to pin it down on one thing and show sufficiency and necessity and make that causal link uh, between plasticity in that one particular thing and learning and memory. So, I am not even going to try that. Uh, right? so, so, we know now that uh, uh, any learning task, any pathological structure, any pathological syndrome is going to affect several ion channels, the structure of uh, the neuron, structure of glial structures, uh, um, the spine structure and so on and so forth. Even myelination uh, is affected by activity basically. Uh, the pumps and transporters, uh, um, the brain metabolism and so on, everything changes basically. That is why it is called as ubiquitous plasticity. It is not confined uh, to the synapses at one point of time, because uh, people were interested in this uh, in this uh, um, very limited world view that they wanted to somehow prove that synaptic plasticity is memory. They were only measuring synaptic strengths uh, and therefore, we were able to make this uh, correlative relationship uh, and assume that it was causal. But once people started or had the ability to measure the other things, uh, became very clear that there are several things changing in these neuronal structures. Uh, so, there is no causal evidence whatsoever uh, that plasticity in synapses mediates biological learning and memory. Artificial neural networks and synaptic learn learning and therefore, uh, are just that they are just artificial. So, you cannot extrapolate from there and say that uh, conclusions that you arrive from here are going to somehow translate over here, because here there are much more things changing. Just because you have a sufficiency proof uh, is not going to uh, make uh, uh, a change in terms of uh, what exactly the biological neuron is uh, doing. And holism is required in machine learning theory, uh, uh, rules for synergistic interactions between synaptic intrinsic and several other forms of plasticity across the nervous system should be somehow abstracted. The same way we did for uh, uh, synaptic plasticity, it is important to consider other forms of plasticity and importantly consider interactions between them. There are some people who are actually doing this. Uh, Eve Marder's lab for instance um, has started looking at uh, changes across uh, different ion channels together rather than looking at only one form of uh, change in one particular structure. Um, there are several labs now starting to look at this, uh, but it is important that uh, it, this is uh, abstracted and brought into machine learning theory as well. Uh, and there is no point in focusing on the only synaptic plasticity and assuming it to be biologically supported, uh, uh, it is not. Thank you. You, you had your hand. Uh.
so uh, with the theta, theta burst pairing, uh, uh, you seem to have the postsynaptic neuron firing at about 100 hertz or so. Which one? No. Uh, was that right? I, I, I just wanted to. Um. Uh, the first slide uh, with the theta burst pairing that you had. Oh, so that is uh, uh, the theta burst pairing protocol. Yes, correct, it correct. would be going at, um, so that's the burst actually. So it does fire at 100 hertz um, within that burst. Um, so if you actually record from neurons in the CA1 pyramidal region um, and look at how exactly they fire, you would see that uh, they follow. That's why it's called as the, the theta burst pairing. Uh, the spacing between this point and this point is 200 milliseconds, which is 5 hertz, uh, which is the theta frequency range. Uh, and if you zoom in on it, uh, you would see that uh, there are five different action potentials, uh, which is a burst. Uh, so it's the intraburst frequency. And CA3 neurons are, uh, can go on that range, basically. Right. Uh, the so second question. Uh, so the sort of more uh, broader question was, uh, so, so at least towards the end, you, you argued that uh, one needs to consider all these other things that have been uh, you know, discovered with, uh, with real biological neurons in terms of uh, plasticity, et cetera. Uh, but but the, 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 the sort of uh, uh, the theoretician in the audience might ask that, you know, what if, so, so this is clearly not a comprehensive list, right? So there are uh, there are several things we have not measured so far, right? right? So uh, maybe the real answer is lying in those things which have not which we have not measured so far, right. and we are I mean barking at the wrong tree and synapses and channels, uh, astrocytes. Everything is basically something which is uh, tomorrow somebody may come and say that all this is uh, just an epiphenomena. You have been measured something wrongly, and the answer is real answer is somewhere else. Uh, but I mean I think. The idea is to not just focus on one thing, and the idea is to go beyond this uh, this focused. Uh, um, I mean, the 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 the, um, the obsession to prove that learning and memory is because of molecule X or molecule Y or molecule Z. That should not be the obsession. The uh, the, the the idea is that uh, you take it beyond that, and degeneracy gives you a kind of broad framework uh, for you to be able to understand. Uh, learning or any biological phenomena for that matter and it, it, if you read that paper it will tell you how evolution uh, um, it, it has an evolutionary uh, reason as well as it were quote unquote uh, um, so so it's it gives you a very broad framework uh, for understanding biological phenomena so so one of the major differences between uh, say a microprocessor and a biological system is the adaptability right uh, you remove one component uh, the microprocessor is not going to do anything, but the biological system, on the other hand, uh, will try to compensate for that. Uh, and in the process, in the process of uh, adapting to that, or in the process of co compensating for that, uh, may screw it up further. Right. So, so the biological system actually tries to change itself, uh, and it's a state-dependent system. It keeps changing. It's not like learning is complete, and from this point onwards, uh, it's a complete system, and it's going to be used for only classification purposes. Uh, it's a continual process. There is no static equilibrium. It's a dynamic equilibrium at best. Uh, right? so, so you have that adaptive structure that is present over there. And that, uh, um, if we have to bring that into picture, and if we have to uh, give uh, the fact that plasticity spans uh, several components, not just one thing, I think degeneracy is a broad kind of idea framework uh, where the system doesn't really care about how it achieves it. Uh, there is a goal. What that goal is, we do not know basically. So there is a goal. There is a physiological goal that is present over there. And it recruits whatever components that it can to achieve that particular goal. If one component is gone, if one component is gone, then it recruits another route uh, to achieve the same thing. It's not redundancy because those components it is recruiting need not necessarily be structurally the same. It can recruit different structural components. Like say, for instance, uh, if you if you consider the classical uh, the classical experiments uh, where they block uh, 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 NMDA receptors or something like that in uh, hippocampus and ask the animal to learn, and the animal will not learn and they will not overtrain it. If you actually overtrain it, uh, it will learn. The 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 even if the hippocampus is lesioned. Uh, you would see that the animal would still learn. It recruits another pathway to do the same thing, basically. Right? So, so these came much later. Um, so the narrative has, uh, had already been formed uh, that synaptic plasticity somehow is memory. And I mean, one of my standard uh, uh, stories uh, is an alternative uh, parallel universe, uh, where somehow somebody comes up with the idea that uh, um, Hebb's idea was about ion channels changing. Uh, and Hopfield talked about changes in uh, the, the uh, the, the nonlinearities that are inherent to the neuron rather than changes in synaptic weights. Uh, 
And somehow the, the first Bliss and Lomo, the paper that came up, uh, that talks about changes in threshold and excitability and stuff like that, uh, that is picked up. Uh, and uh, it proceeds to the 2000s. And somehow in 2000s, uh, somebody says that, oh, the synapses can also change. Uh, so by that time, the narrative had already been formed uh, that somehow ion channels are the reasons, uh, uh, are the reason why learning and memory occurs. Uh, so the synaptic guys have to really fight hard uh, to c include synapses into that particular framework. Uh, so it's, it's a, I mean, what you can consider as progress uh, from one perspective is also an anomaly from another perspective, basically. Right? So, so the, the idea that synapses uh, are somehow the substrate, the substrate uh, for learning and memory is a consequence of multiple historical anomalies. Uh, right? so, I, who, who raised you, yeah. you coordinate? Uh, thank you for uh, uh, giving a fresh perspective yet again. Uh, so just to clear one doubt uh, regarding degeneracy. So suppose I have a function to be achieved and I have a set of si systems A, B, C, either it th that can lead to the f achieving the function or a different set. Uh, is it that at any given point in time, depending on all variables and parameters, uh, the body decides or selects uh, based on energy efficiency? We don't know. We don't know. I mean, we know that it can be achieved through different means. Uh, um, what what exactly is the is the mechanism it uses for choosing one versus the other? And I mean the the other motivation that came for degeneracy is from the variability perspective, uh, right? When modelers use biological data, they actually use the mean and the median or variance. Of, they, they just ignore the variability basically. Even if you record adjacent neurons. Uh, in the same brain regions or in, in structures, in, in simpler structures where there is only one neuron which is controlling uh, a certain rhythm formation and things like that. Uh, you take the animal to animal variability that is so huge uh, that it is impossible to consider a scenario where uh, uh, one particular ion channel is mediating this kind of a rhythmicity basically. Right? So, so that's the other motivation, that is where the, the other part of the motivation to degeneracy comes from there. It's not from this end of the perspective where you have actually measured and you are wondering what exactly is happening. But the, 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 the motivation for degeneracy also comes from the, the, the animal to animal variability, neuron to neuron variability that is uh, present over there. Uh, but what defines that? Uh, I mean, in that case, it would have to be development. Right? So the animal to animal variability, if you see that uh, in one animal, the HCN channel density is higher, the calcium channel density is lower. In another, the calcium channel density is higher, HCN channel density is lower. But at the end of the day, they are producing exactly the same output, basically. Right? So that distinction in terms of which channel is higher and lower, in that kind of a scenario, should be development. It should have come from the point at which the animal was born or before that, basically. So what exactly it chooses, uh, how exactly it chooses one versus the other, uh, uh, we don't know the answer. I mean, uh, I, I don't think uh, anybody knows the answer to that. We know that it is, uh, there are several routes, uh, but which route is taken? Uh, it's like the internet, basically, if you will. Nobody knows. So I was puzzled by uh, something you said in between that um, even if you block one form of plasticity, other forms also disappear. I would have thought that if it's really degenerate, there would be multiple in ways in case, which you could achieve. In this case, uh, okay. there are cases where it is dissociated also. Like say, for instance, uh, if you take uh, this bidirectional example over here, right? So, so here, um, so I showed you that uh, with the LTD protocol, uh, you have a synaptic change over here, and you are, you also have an increase in input resistance. Uh, but if you block uh, um, the synaptic plasticity with an NMDA receptor antagonist. Uh, you would see that this doesn't go away. This exists, uh, but this goes away. On the other hand, if you block the metabotropic glutamate receptor uh, uh, that are present over there, both of them go away basically, right? So, so it's not like there is not a dissociation between intrinsic and, I mean, I won't call it as intrinsic versus synaptic plasticity. It's not like there is uh, no dissociation between plasticity in different components. Uh, uh, in some cases, they go together. It's all dependent upon the signaling mechanism. In, this, in the previous case, uh, it was the kinase, uh, CAMK2 was responsible for increasing this and increasing this basically, right? So, so the, kind, the signaling mechanisms was the same and therefore you have this. Uh, here the dissociation is because of uh, two different kinases being involved uh, uh, in one plasticity versus the other. And therefore, so in, in some cases there is dissociation, in some other cases it's, it's not a generalized truth. 
But in any case, even given this entire context, you can still have lots of combinations that don't work, right? That's also yeah, yeah, equally yeah, interesting yeah, in the sense yeah. that. Yeah. So, so as I said, uh, if you really want to understand plasticity, you have to go down to the signaling level because that is what is changing it. Uh, so, you want to um, phosphorylate or dephosphorylate a channel or a, or a receptor that is present over there. The signaling cascade that is underlying is what is determining which ones are going to be phosphorylated, right? So, so there are a bunch of them which is going to be activated by one signaling mechanism that is below here. So, the rules are there. Uh, what exactly those rules are, we don't know, right? Uh, but if you want to really understand plasticity rules, uh, you have to go to the biochemical end of it. Uh, not going to be able to achieve it uh, by looking at it from the electrical perspective. Uh, uh, I think uh, in the interest cool. of time, uh, we'll stop. Okay, yeah. Uh, Rishi will be here for the next 30 years, so <laughs> you can ask him <laughs> questions anytime. So, uh, Thanks, man. <laughs> let's, th let's thank Rishi, electrical engineer turned neuroscientist.